Now, I uh, personally have been uh, kind of engaged in a little bit of research and study on the issue of language of the law for the last, uh, I would say, 20 years, but more seriously, the last five to seven years. And uh, uh, what led me to it actually was uh, uh, an interesting story of an old lady who walked in to see me once and she, she walks in and she sort of says that, you know, uh, I really don't understand uh, how you lawyers write. So who's this party of the first part and who's party of the second part and, and all those words of where off, there off and, and hair off and so on and so forth. And why can't you just simply write uh, you know, I have to read it. You must keep your reader in mind. And it just struck me as a bolt of lightning. And uh, I sort of, uh, you know, realized, as Justice Loco rightly said, that you have to look at your audience. Now, starting from that point, I kind of tried to figure out that why is it that language of the law, and I'm talking now of, obviously, language of English language of the law uh, is what it is. What makes it what it is? And why is it that, it, that we haven't changed, that this is kind of thing which continues and has continued for a long time and it led to really for the first time, of, even for myself after having been in the profession for well over 35 years at that time, to start looking at some of these things. So uh, today, uh, in a way, I was uh, originally I was asked to speak on specific contracts like mergers and acquisitions and you know sale contracts and so on and so forth. But you know, I I just taken the complete liberty of completely turning that or rather putting that subject aside altogether, but continuing in a way more focused way on some of the issues that Justice Lokur uh, has raised and why. I think that's important because I think what's important is not how to learn to write a particular clause, but it's important how to write at all. It is important that the way we write the language we use and the way, because language is just merely a tool. It's merely, a, obviously it's the most important means of communication, so to say. And for us lawyers, we have to simply unlearn a lot uh, that we have we were told and we, 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 we picked up. And I'm very happy that uh, the audience today is obviously of many uh, young people who are aspiring to be lawyers. And uh, I am, I am I'm, you know, I'm really delighted to, that I have an opportunity of trying to tell them a few things before their brains and their minds start getting polluted with, legal, with legalese and with legal life. So what I do have, so I changed this whole thing around to say, I'm going to talk about the history of the language of the law because it explains why it is what it is and what are the problems with it and how you can avoid those problems and then go into the, the sort of the latter part of uh, my presentation is on plain English. So in other words, by the end of it, I hope that I would have uh, you know, I would have planted a seed which can grow of, of, of curiosity, of learning more about the language, of avoiding the pitfalls, and how you can really write for your audience. So with that, uh, in, uh, 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 with that context, uh, I will now uh, share my presentation. I do have a presentation that I, I made. So let me go uh, uh, straight uh, to that. So let's see now if I can share my screen and see this is the one and it is so uh can you can you see it can you see the screen now please yes yes okay so let me yes. now have a go at it so as the title is hair off there off and wear off What's wrong with the language of the law? And a brief introduction to, to plain English. All right. So let's just simply talk about language for a minute. As I had earlier mentioned, and I just as local mentioned as well, language, the purpose of language is 
communication how to communicate and what is <clears throat> purpose of communication itself understanding readability comprehension and when you look at something that you read or something that you come across as just as lokur was describing the himachal high court judgment Uh, i have have something to say about that actually i do have the wording of that and i have <laughs> justice lokur's comments which got published in the newspaper which i'll share with you later in this uh, presentation i also have with me the famous first paragraph of uh, a judgment which uh, 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 which had much comment on its language and that also was just referred to by justice lokur i will i will talk about that as well so when you read something and you look at something these are the kinds of words as single words that may come to your mind now the purpose as i said is to communicate so just let's look at it now to say how language is the critical component of law so what as as justice lokur explained law is a law of words whether it's regulations opinions contracts private documents and words are also our most essential tool we are wordsmiths that what we do and these days certainly these days it may not have been the case in the past as it was and i will talk about that as part of history of the language of the law now law impacts everyone it impacts everyone the proverbial common person on the street now as i was telling the story of that old lady who came to see me about a, 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 a lease that she wanted to sign now we all know that how legal english how different it is dramatically from our common day everyday speech to the extent that it's incomprehensible to non lawyers so why is that and how is that so let's just look at it from the beginning i call that i say that there were two most significant exports from england ever one was the common law and the other is the english language and literally in its way legal english is amalgam of those two things and former colonies of the british empire so we inherited english but we also inherited common law and it's as i call it it's inseparable twin which is legal english so what is legal english this distinct phrases words and expressions and the second part of it so first part of it is the vocabulary and the second part of it is the manner of composition or how we construct this how we actually write the language actually so what we have in the language of the law actually is and i'll describe that as we go along is accumulated baggage i call it of centuries and i'm talking centuries means 1500 years and during that time as well in parallel english as a language started evolving and that's more after the norman conquest in about 1100 ad but post that period it's honest it's almost as if the language of the law and common speech just have diverged they've actually followed two separate literally two separate lives or 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 histories so let's look at that and the problem with the language of the law is not now one of the first in so to say in literature that i found believe it on it is gulliver's travels jonathan swift 1667 1745 and this was what i'm going to give you here was 300 years ago so he wrote of a society of lawyers who spoke in peculiar cant 
and jargon of their own that no other mortal can understand. Now we move 200 years and I take you to Will Rogers, who was one of the very interesting, uh, you know, uh, 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 characters. He was an actor and columnist in the 1920s and 1930s. And the American Bar Association, to its horror later on realizing, they invited him to be a keynote keynote speaker at their Los Angeles meeting in 1935. And this is what Will Rogers said in that speech. The minute you read something and you can't understand it, you can almost be sure that it was drawn up by a lawyer. Then if you give it to another lawyer to read and he don't know just what it means, when, why, then you can be sure it was drawn up by a lawyer. If it is in a few words and is plain and understandable only one way, it was written by a non-lawyer. Every time a lawyer writes something, he's not writing for posterity. He's writing so that endless others of his craft can make a living out of trying to figure out what he said. Three months after this speech, Will Rogers died in a mysterious plane crash in Alaska, but no lawyer claimed any responsibility. Here is a, another one, one of my favorites. Prima facie, I concur that I shall indeed accept between two and three portions of the proffered crystalline substance in full and final settlement. <laughs> oh, that'll be two sugars then. It is the example of the orange that uh, Justice Locker just gave to us. <coughs> this is what happened to that old <coughs> that came to see me. Party of the first part and party of the second part. Okay, people are confused with it. So let's just go a little bit deeper. So two parts to it, words. So there are words with uncommon meanings. I'll uh, share it with you. Antique, fancy words, Latin and French words, jargon, too many words and big words. And on the construction side, we have long sentences, passive voice, nominalization. I'll talk about that a little bit, prepositional phrases, and compound constructs. So I'm gonna just, just give you a flavor of each one of these. So let me, sorry, I think, yeah, okay. So we actually in law use many words, which are common words, but they carry a very different meaning for lawyers. And that's very confusing for non-lawyers. So let's see this here, word, action. So we talk of it as a lawsuit or other legal proceedings. In common speech, it's just an act, a thing done. Process of doing something is an action. Demise. So we do transfer of property by lease. For everyone else, it's a person's death. Executed. We say signed a document. For everyone else, it's it's a sentence of death. Motion, an application to a court. For others, it's process of moving. Presents. For us, this document in these presents, as we write, nobody understands what it means. For everyone else, it's gives or introduces. Save. For us, it's accept. It's an exception. For others, it is keep safe or rescue or store for the future. Let's look at words of antiquity. You had a, a, a flavor of that from Justice Local. So I'm going to talk about these three phases of history of the English language. So the old English is 500 to about 1180, which is the Norman conquest when the French came and, and conquered uh, England. Middle English is from 1100 to about 1500. And then modern English is onwards. But obviously, there's an origin, so it has much of Old English and Middle English. However, many, many words of O, E, and M, V, M, E are not in common speech English today. But we have retained those words. And now the words that are going to come here, believe it or not, 
are over a thousand years old. Aforesaid, henceforth, forthwith, thenceforth, therein, herein, thereabout, whereby, thereby, thereon, all the hairs and their words are all. More than a thousand years old, they are not really used in common speech English, except they are used by lawyers as if it was absolute the normal thing to do. So we also have what I call fancy and pompous words. You know, we pretend to be more important than we are. And we pretend to say things so that it gives weight to do those things, whether it is in judgments or whether it is in our writing. So lawyers always advise. They don't inform and they don't tell anyone. They advise. We always append a document, never attach it. We ascertain facts. We don't find out facts. Consequently, and thus, we always endeavor, but we never try and envisage, and we don't foresee. Now, the rest of the world doesn't really run into these words all the time. They run into these words all the time. Okay? Latin and French words. Now, this is a very interesting part of the history of the language of the law. English is, as languages go, comparatively a young language. It has been borrower of language words from many, many languages as it evolved. And in law, Latin and French words <coughs> are really a big component of, of the language. And that was so because those words had already established some kind of legally fixed meanings. And this is, think of it, English as a language is developing in parallel and there is a legal system which is continuing, which is using Latin and French words and continues to use them because they were more established and they were very, they were better known. They may not even have been at that point in time an equivalent English word, English, English word. Okay. So while the language, English language as common speech developed and evolved at, on one track, the lawyers remained stuck on one track with those law, with the lowest Latin and French words embedded in there. And the fear was that if I use a new word, which has not been used, although it may mean the same thing, but it's not been used in the past, the precedents may not help me. So English equivalent words were not used by lawyers, even though they were there and present and had evolved. So you were worried about the precedent and you did not want to use a new word or a simpler common speech word because you felt you do not know what it may mean in a court of law. Where are the words actually? Many of them, as you know, are still in use. So you have many Latin words. You have French words, meets and bounds, estoppel, quasi. Lot of the words, we major, pari passu, lot of these words are French words, or old French, not even new modern French, old French and Latin. And as, uh, as Justice Lokut said, a lot of people feel that, you know, Latin makes you look very learned. I mean, in fact, I had a young colleague who joined me once, gave me two paragraphs written on something, and, you know, it was full of, full of a lot of Latin. And I actually asked him, I said, uh, young man, uh, do you, is, you speak Latin at home? So he was a little surprised. He says, no, sir, we don't speak Latin at home. So I said, then why do you do so much Latin in this? So he says, you know what my previous senior told me that makes you look very scholarly and very learned. So I said, well, in that case, you know, we must see. I like to learn Latin, you know, more. So let's just look at it and see which is the closest place to Delhi where Latin is formally taught. And we found a school in southern Italy, 4,800 miles away, is the closest place to Delhi where Latin is, is, is taught. So we use a lot of Latin as part of this. So let's see this. Other is term of the art or languages or jargon. Now, all professions have their special vocabulary. I, you know, I call them fuzzy fuzzy words. So whether it is a chemist, so mechanic, plumber, painter, architect, whoever, 
they all had their fuzzy wuzzy words. And their fuzzy wuzzy words of a profession are of two types, term of art and jargon. And as Justice Lokur said, uh, we are the privileged class as lawyers where our junk, our jargon, our professional fuzzy wuzzy words actually have a name and that is legalese. And obviously it's used generally in a pejorative sense in terms of people making actually fun of our language of the law, which we lawyers and we judges are very proud of. So what is term of the art? It means something which is very precise. It has a precise meaning given in any speciality. In, in our law profession, any word which we claim as term of art gets that standing through persistent professional use in only one way to achieve a specific legal end. So I'll give you some words here, which are of course term of the art and many of them are also understood by common persons, people on the street. So for IP lawyers, for example, or people in the business, infringement, passing off, prior art, assignment, license, injunction, damages, many people understand these words. Mortgage, alibi, agency, surety, bail, latches, lessor, lessee, plaintiff, defendant, suit, contract, all of these are actually term of art. They all carry one defined specific meaning. The trouble is, and this is where the rub lies, that a most, most of the rest of what we use as legalese is jargon. It's also described by some as argot or a slang that is you know, used by a common group as a secret language used by a common group literally. Most of it fails the test of term of art. And statistics show that in normal legal writing, it's about three to 4% of the words which are truly term of the art. Rest of the words that we pretend are term of the art or very precise are actually junk and jargon. Here are some other examples. At issue, cause of action, court below, do care, four corners of the instrument, purported, set down for hearing, times of the essence, hair of, thereof, of, of, same such, said, aforesaid, those are the words that Justice Loku referred to as well. All of this is jargon, argot, and junk. All of this has no place in any modern contemporary language. Too many words. Repetition, doubling of words, superfluous words, and that add, which really add no real meaning. Now look at this. All of us are familiar with this. Now, therefore, in consideration of the premises, the representations, warranties, covenants, and undertakings of the parties here and after set out, and for good and other valuable consideration, comma, the parties agree among themselves as follows. You know, this can be replaced with just this. The parties agree as follows. Everything else that you see on top is absolute rubbish. It has no meaning in law, zero meaning in law but we persist, we use those too many words. And then I want to talk about word doubling, which is duplicating words with identical meanings from different origins. So as I mentioned earlier, many languages have contributed. So what happened that as precedence came along and a word in Latin was given a meaning and then a word in French was given a legal meaning or accepted and precedence got created, lawyers started doubling up to be absolutely sure. So I have a look, for example, null and void. This is Latin is null, old French is void. And now we modern lawyers, have added more to it. So we now say null, void, and of no effect whatsoever. So where a word null or void would do, now we use 10 words where one would do. Will and testament. 
they mean exactly those same thing it's old english and latin so every the every second will that you will see in this country on top is will say will and then it will say this is my last will and testament fit and proper this old english french mean exactly the same thing save and accept it is french and latin mean exactly the same thing both both words mean exactly the same thing and then we also use extra word to add emphasis how many of us have written a sale deed which says i hereby transfer sign sell convey all meaning exactly the same thing have and hold from and after let and hindrance each and every we use these words every day without thinking twice we continue to use so we have too many words so since shashi was mentioned and as dr krishi said and you know this is we all are from the same alma mater and shashi is uh, uh, one of our stars so i have actually a slide dedicated to him and that slide is coming up next on big words don't use a big word when a singularly unloquacious and diminutive linguistic expression will satisfactorily accomplish the contemporary necessity which just simply means use small words <laughs> Okay. but we will i will share on the screen the famous judgment of our chief justice and you will you shall see how he was trying to impress everybody in the world so let's just come to now construction style so the long sentence i call it the curse of the long sentence and this is a article or actually a book uh, an entire series of justice uh, of lord denning are amazing but one of his best is called the closing chapter and in that he has an essay on plain english and this is what lord denning says if you use an over long sentence in your speech you will lose your hearer before you get to the end of it he will not be concentrating as much as you are if you write an over long sentence in your opinion or judgment the reader will get bemused he will say to himself i must read that sentence again so as to get the hang of it that destroys its effect altogether so and the beauty is that fixing the long sentence is one of the easiest things that we can do as lawyers so the core problem that we have is that we will shove in too many thoughts too many different ideas in one sentence so within the sentence we'll have the main theme we'll have the details we'll have qualifications exceptions conclusions exceptions to expectations exceptions and consequences okay and it's a very simple tip that i follow one thought per sentence and i'll give you an example so that you understand what i'm saying and also understand it from the from the perspective of a reader who is not familiar with reading legal documents or long documents so look at this this is from a actual contract nagarjuna coal company limited is a company engaged in the mining and selling of coal comma its mines and place of business being located near at near nagpur maharashtra whereas narmada coal company mining company is a company engaged in buying and selling coal located in amdabad gujarat is one sentence 44 words not a very large sentence but see what happens to a reader and when you look at that sentence you say so it actually has four thoughts in it which have not much bearing on each other only when you get to the middle somewhere you may start understanding that nagarjuna coal company is not selling its mine and place of business and it remains doubtful who's located in amdabad the narmada coal and mining company or its coal and the problem is and that's what research has shown over the last over 100 years the flow of words is such that the mind gets transported from the beginning of the sense to the end with confusing suddenness about the businesses and locations all muddled up so this is what i have done i just put four full stops and uh, americans say period they have a good reason to say period which means 
it is when you stop, you pause. So Nagarjuna Coal Company Limited is a company engaged in mining and selling coal, full stop. Its mines and place of business are located near Nagpur, Maharashtra, full stop. Narmada Coal and Mining Company is a company located in Ahmedabad, Pama, Gujarat. It is engaged in buying and selling coal. So I tell always my young associates and anyone who comes up to me with a long sentence and I say, friend, full stops are free. Nobody charges you anything for using full stops. Please use them. Please use full stops. Here is, this is the famous one, dear friends. This is 299 words. First sentence is 73 words. Second sentence is 226 words. Big, pompous words. Large, big sentences. And this is the one which elicited that article called Justice by Thesaurus, because most of it actually is fairly rubbish. I simplified it. This is what Justice Chief Justice Deepak Mishra was actually trying to say. Is criminalization or defamation constitutional? Question mark. How to balance these two rights, the citizen's fundamental right to freedom of speech and the rights of others to effectively protect their reputation. Two sentences, 29 words. Let's go back for a minute. This patch of it, which I don't want to read it because it gives you a headache. But that's what he's trying to say. This is what he's trying to say in that. Okay, let's go to voice. As we know from our school grammar, Voice is the relationship between the subject and the verb. So active voice, subject performs the action of the verb, then the sentence is active. And passive voice is subject is recipient of the action. Then the sentence is passive. And my famous favorite illustration is this. Passive voice, the mouse was eaten by the cat. Active voice. The cat ate the mouse. Now, one of the big problems of language of the law is, and construction style is, our, our use of passive, too much use of passive voice. And that complicates lives for the readers. So why? Because it's abstract. And I say you why? It's abstract because. The normal human comprehension pattern as shown by research is that there is an actor who performs the action of the verb and something happens. This is how our natural wiring of the human mind is. And passive voice basically belies that. Then we also have other ways in which active passive voice gets confusing. For example, the actor, that is the person who's doing something, need not be mentioned. Passive voice sentence is also longer than the active voice sentence. See this one here. It leads to vagueness. A mistake was made. Grammatically perfect sentence. But what does it do? It actually literally hides the blame body. It hides the actor. Okay. Let's take a couple of examples. The union filed a complaint is active. The complaint was a complaint was filed by the union. It's longer by three words. The trial judge will deny your application. Your application will be denied. The legislative history supports our conclusion. Our conclusion is supported by the legislative history. And if you see the second example, the actor is missing. Your trial, the trial judge will deny your application translates to your application will be denied. The actor is not even mentioned as to who will deny it. Nominalization is another favorite of the lawyers. And that is, we actually 
convert a verb into a noun and i'll show you how that happens and what it does it actually buries the active verb and makes the sentence longer once again so i'll just give you two examples the firm has made the decision to undertake the representation of iiln this is with buried verb and i'll describe to you where the buried verbs are they are actually in dark blue and the active verb simply says the firm has decided to represent iiln the licensee will furnish an indemnification to the licensor the licensor will indemnify the licensor so through nominalization we weaken the verb and we create a new word now you can see the firm has made the decision now the decision here actually from the verb we have created a noun the verb is decide we've created a new thing so we have made the decision is simply substituted by decided to undertake the representation of is simply replaced by represent so i tell my young colleagues to i said be mindful of the ion words i call them the eon words look at the eon words and eliminate them so you'll see all the eons here coming indemnification representation decision so you find the eon words you will find buried verbs you replace the eon words with an active strong verb compound phrases favorites of the lawyer we use a long prepositional phrase which can typically be substituted by just one word and interesting thing is this happens to us more when we are writing not when we are speaking so take this example in the event the plaintiff files documents if the plaintiff files documents so in the event is replaced by simply if now just think of it in common speech i mean do you do you tell your friend uh in the event i come to your house or in the event i go to delhi you will never say that you will always say if i come to your house or if i go to delhi but when we lawyers get the pen in our hand or our hands on the keyboard something happens to us and that's when we start using words like this or expressions or compound phrases like this with regard to in close proximity in light of the fact that in order to in the course of in manner in which in the instant case these are the proposition word we use now let me give you the simple one word replacement with regard to about in close proximity near in the light of the fact that because or given that in order to is just simply to in the course of during in manner in which how in the instant case this case is binding on is unable to can't is desirous of wants on the part of by and prior to is before all these on the right are common speech day to day english language words which are absolute equivalents of the string of words that you see on the left now i bring come to plain english It says you heard that much of this from just this roku but let me go over it again so the first test of the language is does this language clearly concisely and comprehensively communicate or not so why don't we apply that test to legal english or to legalese second are citizens entitled to know what rights and obligations the constitution confers on them is this the domain only of lawyers and judges sitting in the supreme court and the high court or is it of every person who is a citizen of this country 
do those impacted by law or regulation have a right to understand the code of conduct expected of them every law are citizens entitled to understand judgments and opinions given by the judiciary do parties to the contract have the right to understand the promises exchanged by them and is the public at large entitled to be aware of the things that really matter to them even if they do not grasp the details now, this is the question that the profession or the questions that the profession the drafters those who draft legislation those who draft contracts those who write academic papers as the judge said we have to ask these questions to ourselves so sorry this is a duplication here now over the years many of the greatest writers of even the legal english and legal jurists and judges and lawyers have pleaded for and promoted the use of plain language plain english plain language thomas jefferson the second president of the united states and one of the key drafters of the constitution and you heard the judge say a little bit about this earlier today in drafting statutes my fellow lawyers have the habit of making every other word as said or aforesaid and saying everything over two or three times so that nobody but we of the craft can untwist the diction and find out what it means the most valuable of all talent that of never using two words where one will do and again coming back to my favorite person lord denning see this here what it says and i wish justice deepak mishra would read this some day don't use long words unless your hearers and or readers understand them you may understand them yourself but they may not if your hearer says to himself that is a word i've never heard before what does it mean you have failed if your reader says i must look it up in the dictionary again you have failed you have not conveyed your meaning to him a lot of speakers and writers do not appreciate the simple truth they use long words so as to show off think about this one of the greatest jurists of our time there are people who done phd's by the way on lord denning's writing style he was the first one who introduced titling and subtitling and paragraphing and subparagraphing judgments in england and i'll show you a piece of his work shortly this is david melenkoff the probably the best historian of the language of the law most law can be expressed in ordinary english most of it is but by the time lawyers get through mushing up ordinary english very few english speakers and not and only some lawyers can recognize it they throw in words that were headaches before the age of steam they try to get by stuffing law into sentences that aren't built to take that load instead of rejecting the rubbish and keeping the good in the language of the law they swallow it whole and end up with law sick i love this word law sick that's what we do to people so why do we persist why is it that when our readers and those who we service they do not understand much of what we say so why does this happen so let's have a look at some of the reasons as to why this happens some of the possible reasons okay so as said earlier at one point in time law was indeed the domain of the elites the those the people who studied french who studied latin it didn't have anything to do with most people because most people didn't have any rights it only concerned the court the royal court the courtiers and the aristocracy but now everyone all lay people they all have rights and obligations they have rights and duties so forms and conventions what i earlier read to you but now therefore in consideration we are off those are the things which have zero relevance in this day and age 
because we lack the knowledge of the history of the legal language and how it has evolved, we have therefore a huge fixation on precedent, which is misplaced because I will talk about that as well. And this is the most important part, and there's been several students here. I have been a victim of this. Legalese got handed down to me from my seniors, that this is how it is. And if you asked a question, you were just simply put down with the idea, do you want to be a lawyer or not? If you want to be a lawyer, this is how you have to write. That's what we were all taught, taught. That's how we were taught. And the beauty is here, and we are still, we talk to students and to faculty. No one teaches us how to use words. Words are the tools. And I say it is like a plumber not knowing how to use a wrench. 80% of our time, maybe more, is spent in reading, writing, and articulation. But nobody tells us how to use that toolkit, how to use the tools. So we are told and taught convincing how to write a lease deed. So people mug it up. And the day of the exam, they come and they vomit it on the paper. And everyone says, well, wow, great. So I've, I've learned how to draft clauses. And as I said in the beginning, I think what we have to first learn is how to use the tools, how to use the words, how to put them together, how to construct a good sentence. I don't have to teach you how to write a clause. I have to give you the tools. I have to tell you how to use those tools and you will build your own beautiful sentence and you don't build your own beautiful paragraphs and a whole document. So writing skills, frankly, of that type are absent in law schools, in law school curriculum. And I put this challenge and I put a challenge. Now people can go to you know chat and give me an answer to this, that how many of the faculty and the students have actually read a book on legal writing? How many of them can name an author, an authoritative author on the subject? And in large rooms full of very senior lawyers, the answer has been a blank largely as far as I'm concerned. And it was a blank for me 10 years back. So why do we persist? Good answers. There is a very strong perception in our audience which says we deliberately do it. And Jeremy Bentham was the first one 250 years ago. He says we deliberately do use a complex language. Lawrence Friedman is one of those apologists. Legal style and vocabulary of lawyers are indispensable for the cohesiveness and prestige of the profession. And see the other side of that point. Stuart Aubach, who was a very well-renowned uh, legal reporter for the New York Times, he said, the lawyer's language serves as a secret handshake in a fraternity, letting others know you are one of the tribe. So we do the to exclude. We use a certain slang and we are proud of that because we want to exclude others from that community. And sorry, this is coming again. There is some challenge. All right. The most important one that I keep on hearing, and it's the most false one, is legalese is precise. It's a false pretense. And let me show you how. So first of all, the real tiny bit that is precise is term of art, nothing more. Most of it is pretentious, it's vague, ambiguous. Otherwise, how do you explain 70 volumes of words and phrases legally defined? Seven zero. And look at this stat. This was part of my essay I wrote uh, a, a month back on how shell is such an overused and misused word. So shell, which most of people here would on the first instance say, ha, usme kya hai? we all know what shell means. You'll be surprised. There are 1300 judgments from around the world, common law countries, over a hundred pages in words and phrases legally defined on shell. Judges have held shell to mean may, might, should. They have held it to mean many different things, believe it or not. So there's not much precision in our language. We pretend that there is. So the top one, I think, is the most important one. And I've had some personal interesting experiences with this. 
uh, a month, uh, uh, a few years back, when I was a very new enthusiastic promoter of plain English, uh, a, a colleague of mine brought me a contract which had come from another law firm. There were, in one part of it, there were two pages of unbroken text. So I told him, I said, you know what, let's break this into paragraphs. Let's give heading and subheadings and let's put some sense into this. This is ridiculous. So we did that. We sent it back. Two days later, the contract came back with everything restored the way it was and with a little comment in a footnote which said, lawyers don't write like this. It is absolutely, absolutely true that if you try and introduce anything new, anything which is contemporary, which is not so conventional, this is what you will hear from your profession. But I think there are other reasons. I think it's very economical for us to use old forms. I think we are lazy. And the other thing is, I think we simply don't care about our audience, as the justice said. We don't care about our audiences, and there is no disincentive. There is zero disincentive to change. And I firmly believe, and so do many others, ashamed to say that as a lawyer, that it is strategic in, 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 in some industries like insurance and banking and consumer facing industries where you hear the proverbial small print. They actually want to make things difficult because if the consumer understood what she's signing, she will never sign it or she will question it or she will raise doubts is deliberately done in many, many industries. And of course, it's a subject of jokes. Translate this easy to read statement to legalese Wilson so the consumer will have to hire a lawyer to explain it. I'm telling you, I have seen boarding pass, I won't name the airline, it still exists. The boarding pass still exists, which is full of legalese. A boarding pass. I mean, forget about a warranty for a refrigerator which a housewife needs to understand or your insurance policy. You need to understand what is covered, what is not covered. A car warranty what you're entitled to as a first service is unbelievable. Unbelievable of what we inflict in what we call adhesion contracts, B2C contracts, which is business to consumer contracts are so terrible. So plain English movement, many, many countries around the world have been on it for the last about 30, 40 years now. Uh, particularly the consumer right movements in many of the common law jurisdictions actually have led this in terms of saying that whether it's the proverbial small print or all of those uh, items. I mean, I have seen laws in Pennsylvania, state laws in the US in many states where they actually have guidelines, which actually refers to Fleisch's reading formulas, which actually says your sentence should be more than so many words and you have to use active voice, believe it or not. So there are states which are actually laying down that for consumer facing documents, you have to make them simple and plain, even if you don't do them for very difficult, tough legal documents. Uh, England, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all of them have uh, uh, certainly communication of the government concerning citizens and the public. Uh, America has the Plain Writing Act, uh, which was brought in by Obama in 2010. And of course, the legislation in all of these countries have legislative drafting manuals. England, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, they all have, which for instance, Australia now, shall is banned. They do not use shall. If it's a mandatory obligation, it is used as must. They have uh, the federal uh, uh, appellate court rules in the US have been redrafted a few years back. There's not a single shell in the whole rule. The entire rules are shellless. So people are doing this at the moment. And many, many, many uh, in the legal profession are leading the reform. The London law firms in the early 90s started the process of simplifying a lot of this. And it happened when the top five London firms called the Magic Circle, they started adopting this. And then the most of the industry started to follow suit. So let's see what's happening in India. We all know that we picked this up. We got it as an inheritance. We never really learnt it. We adopted and continued to pick and use. 
there is still huge amount of lack of awareness and absence of skill training in law school and in the profession as justice uh, lokur earlier said a lot of our legislation primary and secondary continues to be complex uh, i encourage people to read the latest code of uh, which has come in the labor code there are there are sections in it and particular anyone who is interested i can refer to at least two of them that is section 85 and section 87 incredible they are difficult i have been practicing law for 46 years now uh, one of them i still haven't fully understood as to what it means so either i am absolutely foolish or the other thing is very difficult i don't know which is true uh, with these manual on plain english legislative drafting was done but sits uh in some dusty place somewhere because the department of uh, legislature in the ministry of law uh, refuses to change they refuses to they they continue with their old style uh the curriculum development committee some of you would know i think if i'm not mistaken i think dr ranveer singh was part of that which was set up by gopal subramaniam in 2009 when he served as an interim president uh, chairperson of the bar council of india and they draft they they brought out a very brilliant uh, 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 you know proposed syllabus for the first two years and it was put up on the website of the bar council of india in 2010 and in that they had a subject a whole subject on legal english and that committee that you can by the way anyone interested can still go to the website of bar council of india and after 11 years is still sitting there for public comment uh our society of indian law firms uh, we have over the last two years taken uh, initiative to promote use of plain english uh there is a start of the campaign over the last year we have been running training programs for lawyers from law school from law firms to to understand some of these things and to start implementing them now i am literally on the last uh, slide of so archaic and stuffy prose is out we have to jump quickly please we need to feel comfortable with contemporary style so why instant case and why not this case and why inter alia and why not among others it's simple and we can make a modest beginning all the reds are the ones that we can avoid latin and jargon ancient words like here or there of difficult and superfluous words long sentences and passive voice we can adopt and start using simpler commonly used words lesser number of words hang make subject verb and object together hang together in the beginning of the sentence as much as possible use shorter sentences use active voice and i bring you back to lord danny a massive unbroken page of print is ugly to the eye and repulsive to the mind a long unbroken paragraph is indigestible split it up into sentences if you find that you must have a long sentence break it up with a suitable punctuation and look at the master three words in the next sentence sometimes a dash full stop at other times a colon or a semicolon full stop again a three word sentence often a comma it enables the reader to get the sense more readily and look at the master at work i urge you to please read this paragraph it will take you 2 minutes and i think i'm still within time very well within time and i want to say something about this now look at the judge in one paragraph he sets up 
the legal problem. What is at issue? Compare it to our Chief Justice's opening paragraph. He sets out the facts. I can tell you that an eighth grader who knows English, if he reads this paragraph or she reads this paragraph, will be able to understand what is at hand. What is it that the judge is trying to decide? And this is his judgment, opening paragraph, British Railway Board, Customs and Excise in 1977. 12 sentences, 248 words, sentence length longest is 38 words, shortest is seven words, average sentence length is 20.7 words. This is what is called legal writing that you can explain the most complex proposition in simple terms. This was the judgment of 2018 with Justice Lokur was referring to. He didn't take the name of the judge. I don't have any hesitation. The name of the judge is Justice Sarveshwar Thakur of Himachal High Court. This was, is part of the judgment. It's available on the net and is worth reading. This is the judgment which was before I think it was before Justice Lokur and Justice Shah, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, I know that uh, Justice Mother Lokur was there in that bench. And this is what happened. On appeal, a bench of the Honorable Supreme Court of India, having failed to understand the judgment, set the verdict aside and sent the case back to the High Court judge for redrafting his judgment. According to a newspaper report, the bench comments, commented, we'll have to set this aside <laughs> because one cannot understand this. Now, I'm going to end with a clip, and I hope you'll be able to uh, hear it or what it is. Because, and, uh, and, 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 Well, before you go home for the holidays, Minister, Sir Humphrey has something to say to you. Minister, just one thing. I wonder if I might crave your momentary indulgence in order to discharge a by no means disagreeable obligation which has over the years become more or less established practice within government circles as we approach the terminal period of the year calendar, of course, not financial. <laughs> In fact, not to put too fine a point on it, week 51. And submit to you with all appropriate deference for your consideration at a convenient juncture a sincere and sanguine expectation, indeed confidence. Indeed, one might go so far as to say hope that the aforementioned period may be at the end of the day when all relevant factors have been taken into consideration. <laughs> susceptible of being deemed to be such as to merit a final verdict of having been by no means unsatisfactory in its overall outcome and in the final analysis to give grounds for being judged on mature reflection to have been conducive to generating a degree of gratification which will be seen in retrospect <laughs> to have been significantly higher than the general average <laughs> what's he talking about well minister i th I think Sir Humphrey just wanted to crave your momentary indulgence in order to discharge a by no means disagreeable. <laughs> all right, all right, Bernard. Hum Humphrey, at the end of the day, Minister, all be things uh, being... Uh, just to... Uh, yes, Minister. Are you saying Happy Christmas? <laughs> yes, Minister. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm done with that. That's what we do, right? Just imagine. <laughs> So, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Sagar, for this very lucid and detailed presentation on the, on the effectiveness of legal writing. And I felt like uh, I'm a professor of management. I felt like sitting in the class of history of English language and also history of legal language, the way it has evolved in India. So it's a great, and I'm, I'm sure that we are going to use these videos in our classes, in our law school, and it will be a great learning for uh, students and faculty members. 
Uh, I've already got demands from PPT from the participants. So I don't know uh, whether we will be violating intellectual property rights of, no, no. of Mr. Saga. Uh, okay, so my uh, sense... Free, free to be used. I mean, I'm quite okay. happy to, okay. to share it. So I will... Uh, it, it, it's a, uh, I probably need to use the Dropbox or something to I'll send it to, to yes. Sanjay. So you, know, you are free to use it. I This should, you sure. know, spread it out as wide. This part of the campaign. Yes, yes. So thank you. So, uh, so, so I got to know uh, about the, the closing chapter, uh, the book called Closing Chapter by Lord Denny. But as a, as a lay person, uh, I understand that developing a reading habit influences our writing. And are there any books available in, in the legal profession uh, which can, you know, promote, which if I read, I start writing in a plain and simple English? Because if, I'm, if, if, if I have read, suppose my favorite is uh, Mahatma Gandhi's bi autobiography, My Experiment with Truth, or Ernest Hemingway, The Old Man and the Sea, where, you know, I have learned how to write simply and clearly. So uh, do you have your own favorites, both in the general I mean, and, and also in the legal profession? So, so there are a, a couple of uh, uh, thoughts there, which uh, I would say, first of all, frankly, frankly, Denning is the best. Yes. And I think Justice Lokur is there and he will probably endorse it that his judgments and his style of writing, the simplicity and how beautifully he writes. I mean, I, I think, uh, they, they, as I mentioned earlier, there actually are PhD thesis in literature, on Denning's literature. I mean, yeah. it is incredible. Now, Denning uh, 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 has written uh, a number of books. In fact, quite interestingly, uh, the closing chapter uh, uh, was, in a strange way, his first book. Uh, and that was a time when he was just stepping down. He died at the ripe old age of uh, 100 in uh, 1999. He was born in 1899. So the closing chapter is a, a selection of essays. And apart from that, there is a series of books which are all published by Universal Book Company here in India. They are very reasonably priced. Yes. All of them are 450 to 500 rupees. Uh, and it's an anthology. It's, it's, it's about six books uh, written by Lord Denning. They are all available. I would say that to, to every student of law, I would say to every judge, you know, read Denning. And really it improves, it's huge in terms of language. Now, in terms of writers of the English language, of course, there are uh, the language of the law. Uh, I think the most prominent of uh, them is Brian Garner, uh, completely mm -hmm. outstanding. Uh, you can uh, simply Google Brian Garner and you will see the book. And he also has been the editor of Blackstone's Legal uh, Dictionary for the last many, many years. But his yes. work over the last, and he has authored two books with uh, Justice uh, uh, Anton uh, Scalia. They were very good friends. Uh, I have all of the books of, uh, uh, of Brian Garner. Uh, Joe Kimball is uh, another great writer. Uh, Ken Williams on drafting of contracts. Uh, so there are yeah. several. Uh, then there's Hans Dramstader, who actually wrote a book from where I stole the title, Hair of, Where of, and Everywhere of. Uh, so there are very many contemporary uh, writers. Uh, but I would say, look at Denning, read Denning's books, read Denning's judgments. If you really want to be a good writer as a, 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 as a legal professional, go with Denning. I mean, yes. it's, you know, it's, I have found that to be, so, in, you know, in my reading list, that'll be number one. In my reading list, then, Elements of Style by Brian Garner uh, would be very high. Uh, uh, so there are many, many, many uh, books by Brian Garner. I can, you know, I can go on. I have, a, you know, yeah. old, there are about 12 or 15 volumes that he's written. And... Uh, People interested in uh, history of the language of the law, the most comprehensive mm -hmm. work is of David Melenkoff, uh, published in 1963, by the way. And uh, uh, again, beautifully written book. And then those who want to read just the smaller one, the good old White and Strunk is there. Wydak, mm -hmm. Richard Wydak's 75, 80 page book on uh, plain, plain English uh, is yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, David uh, Melenkoff also has a thinner volume called Legal Writing Sense and Nonsense. So there are mm -hmm. plenty of books out there. The unfortunate part is that it's not so much 
promoted or, or read or, uh, or even part of the curriculum in any of the law schools that I know of. So in India. So we'll, cer we'll certainly like to incorporate in our law school and buy those copies also. Uh, if I can ask Justice Lokur, his favorites on the legal writing, the books which influenced him on that. Yes, uh, well, Lord uh, Denning, of course, is uh, number one. But I would also place uh, uh, Justice uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes yes. uh, mm -hmm. as uh, number one, a joint number one with Lord Denning. Uh, Justice Holmes uh, passed away in the 1930s, you know, so mm -hmm. he's like many years ago, but outstanding. So yes. I think if, uh, you know, for judgments and all that, uh, and for good legal writing, I think these two are top class. Yes. Of course, uh, if you're looking at general literature, you know, other than mm -hmm. writing, you have some outstanding uh, authors, Charles Dickens, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, they, they, there's plenty of it going around. And uh, like you said, uh, you yes. know, if you read something, it definitely influences your style of writing. Yes. That, uh, I would certainly go along with that. Yes. And I, actually, I may add, yeah. by the way, which I may add, mm -hmm. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. 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 It's an yeah. incredible book yeah. for language. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So thank you. So one more question uh, here. So dealing with complex issues like energy, power, healthcare, life sciences, technology, capital markets, securities, in, you know, you, 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 you will get to use a lot of targets because that's how the, the subjects are well defined. So how will you not bring those legalese or the jargons from those subjects in the judgment or in drafting? So what's the way out in that? So that you know, common people can understand you know, the drafting also as well as the judgment. Yeah, Jyoti, uh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think there are, there are two pieces here, which I mm -hmm. see. So one is uh, again, and and uh, and I think uh, can I call you mother? Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've always called him that. <laughs> so, so, so he referred to in his in his presentation when he talked talked about judgments <coughs> and legislation and so on. So it is true that there is a fair fair bit of thing which uh, we lawyers and we sort of persons in the legal trade uh, that we write with the assumption that mostly it will be read largely by lawyers or a common person who uh, is, you know, either who gets to understand it from a lawyer. But what's happening today, and that's where the difference has come from 1280 from Magna Carta to now is the layperson's rights and obligations and duties and how law touches every aspect of our life now. I mean, if you look at the number of laws that existed in 1250, uh, in any country, uh, uh, you know, people say we are over legislated in India, but I'm talking more generically. Look at the number of laws which govern everything from what should go into refrigerant uh, coolant to consumer safety to all sorts of things. So what has happened is that on the other side, and that's the other side of the coin, and I almost call it when you talk of, you know, business B to C as business to consumer, and I call it as, uh, you know, lawyer to consumer, and I call it L to C. I think that translation part is something that we have to deal with because there are many, many, many term of the art which are understood. A common person on the street, even when you ask him, and most people uh, who kind of need to have access to these things will know who's a plaintiff, who's a defendant. I don't tell him, Ki jis ne suit file kia. I don't have to say that to him. If I say plaintiff, he will understand. Lease, lesser and lessee, landlord and tenant, many, many, most people will understand. Most people understand some simple terms, even of mortgage and things like that. So the many term of art, which are fully understood, there could be some concepts like, like a lot of the Latin stuff that people will use as, uh, as Madan said earlier, actually, there is no need. There is no need for that Latin stuff. It can be written in simple and plain English. So this translation of L to C, I call it, is where yes. the challenge lies. And we yeah. have to start at probably the lower end. And, and that's a low hanging fruit, as I call it, is simple things like consumer facing documents, right? Application forms, mm -hmm. right? 
warranty yes. cards yeah. insurance policies your car registration in i i'm i'm giving you you know instance after instance and i gave you the instance of a boarding pass of vistara airline i can name it now have a look at it the boarding pass is full of leavings so there are consumer facing things on which the communication is to the consumer and i think we need to start fixing the problem there there will be i mean if two doctors are having a huge discussion let me put to you yeah. uh, about a patient who has cancer they are discussing it now when they have to discuss that with the patient what would they do you had that experience uh, where the doctor is trying to explain to you a very difficult uh, a technical issue they have learned that art of doing it when they talk amongst themselves they'll talk in highly technical language but when they talk to you they will dumb it down they will make it simplified to say that you needn't to know all the details but you know sufficiently about the issues involved about what is that stake here and what it may mean to you so i I've, i've given a very long convoluted answer but this is work in progress so there will be some yes. areas of law where you will have to end up using technical terms but as i said research shows not more than 4% of the words technically are really term of the art rest that what we claim to be term of art is actually jargon and junk which can easily be replaced by simple words and by conventions like i told you through the party the first part there is no need to say that why don't you give the names to the parties use their first names if you have to there are simple things that we can do to make life easier for non lawyers and i think that should be the first goal of any plain english movement how do we make life Jyoti, simpler jyoti may i ask lawyers. yes sir you know the the term of art itself uh, is a jargon which you introduced and i had for the first time is it the, can you replace it with something simpler no term of the art means a a a, a word an art is it can be plumbing it can be electrical it can be atomic it can be whichever art so term of art is of that art a plumber use their mechanics use their own when they start talking complex thing about carburetors you will not know so those are some terms as i said where the legal meaning is fixed but for example i give example of shan i think madan knows that i wrote that article about you know month it was six weeks back that how shall is used in actually been interpreted in eight different ways now for shall for a lot of the people said oh bada mazboot word hai that is what i used to hear you know it is the king shall it isn't the king we made it to look like the king but we use it all wrong there are many such words that we will use which are here of there of same such they have zero legal meaning they have no fixed meaning in law now if i were to use the word mortgage and the case came up before justice lokur he'll immediately know what i'm talking about that is term of art it is consistently applied with a fixed meaning with a fixed legal consequence i don't have to explain in my thing to say what is mortgage ki maine apna house bank ko mortgage kar diya everybody understands even a common lay person will understand what that means now if i to describe that i have i have i have given my title deeds i have deposited them with the bank they will keep it against that i have now borrowed money when i return the money the, the the title deed will come back to me i have to describe the whole transaction now that entire transaction is been given one name of mortgage so we know what mortgage means we know what license means or infringement means in in for intellectual in intellectual property sphere so there are many words which are very well known and recognized so that the term of art is actually if you go to the dictionary itself it, it will show you so each art has its own term so art means a profession so plumbing electricians atomic scientists uh, 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 space uh, uh, scientists doctors orthopedics physiotherapists they all have their lingo and that lingo has technical words in it you know i i just do like you, to i do think we can we do one thing do you think we can replace the uh, expression art with profession the term of not the all of them all of them may not be professions as well okay yeah so engineering right you know so it's it's that's how it has been it's, it's so so really for us those special words 
which have a special meaning in law and are consistently applied. That is what we will call term of art. And the research shows that in normal legal writing, not more than 4% really are term of art. So, so Professor Mishra, is the problem yes, with those 4% out of 96? Today, it is the other way around. You saw Justice Mishra's opening uh, paragraph. Yeah. There are words in it which are not legal, which are not, they are just words. That's mm -hmm. one of the big problems. Yes. Yes. I think, uh, I, think uh, I just wanted to it. add uh, two points. You know, one uh, about what uh, Jyoti said that, uh, you know, party of the first part and all that. Now, in judgments, you know, we tend to use respondent number three, the respondent number five. Now, who is respondent number three? I have to go right back to the beginning of the judgment to try and find out who is respondent number three. Now, if respondent number three has a name. Why can't I use it? You know, so or a plaintiff, there could be four or five plaintiffs. And I say plaintiff number two. You know, who, yes. what, what does that mean? Okay, so I think there, there is, you know, uh, judgment writing, of course, has to undergo a massive change. The second thing that I just wanted to mention was about this use of technical words. You see, now what has happened is that uh, we have all kinds of tribunals, you know, telecom tribunal, this tribunal, that tribunal, and we have specialists in those tribunals. So they have grown up using these words. So they think like lawyers, that uh, everybody must be understanding it. You know, when I use a particular word, uh, if just, I understand it, uh, why can't you understand it? Just, uh, Mother, so, just think uh, of what happened with average gross revenue. Just see what has happened with it. Yeah, the telecom yeah. industry is going to kill the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it has, I think it has almost killed it. But uh, anyway, so here you Close are. To it. You know, so this is an excellent example. So, Everybody thinks, ah, you know, I know, since I know it, everybody knows it, but that's not correct. That's where, you know, legal writing has to undergo a change, judgment writing has to undergo a change.